Well, Dr. James K. A. Smith, thank you so much for joining us on A Pastor and a Philosopher Walking to a Bar. Yeah, this is uh, this is like a, a prime opportunity for me. You guys, I where's the bar is the only thing I'm wondering. <laughs> it's pretty low. It's pretty low. Pretty <laughs> oh, low. there it is. <laughs> Elijah Craig is not a bad opener. Very good. Are you? Do you? Uh, do you enjoy bourbons or whiskeys, Jamie? Very much. Oh, uh, I, I'm I involve, I enjoy many spirits. Actually, I'm more of a cocktail guy than a sipper. But um, my my uh, favorite jam right now is what. Of my best friend Mark introduced me to Uncle Nearest. I've heard of this. Yes, I've heard of it. Too. So this has a really Very interesting nice. backstory. So apparently, this guy was the first master distiller at Jack Daniel's. Literally taught Jack Daniel how to distill, and then they kind of washed him from their history until just because recently. he was black. He was a slave. Yes. Yeah. yeah. This I've heard. Of. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a really, it's a great, great bourbon. I'm glad to see it revived in that way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so now we know what your favorite whiskey is, but can you tell our listeners just a little bit about you, Jamie, your, your background, what you're doing, where this book came from. The book is called how to inhabit time. And I can tell you, Kyle and I loved it. Yep. I mean, just oh, really thank loved you it. so much. Thank um, you. Give our listeners just a little bit about James K. A. Smith's world. Yeah. My, my uh, day job, so to speak, is I'm professor of philosophy at Calvin university, just across the lake from you guys. Uh, I've been here for 20 years. I teach my training is, uh, continental philosophy, French and German phenomenology. Uh, but I have, I guess, for probably the past 15 years or so, sort of as a writer, leaned into doing more work as a translator of philosophy for the church, I would say, um, because I think uh, philosophy offers a lot of resources for spiritual counsel. And this book really uh, kind of grows out of that. The other, the other uh, sort of passion... Uh, work that I have is I'm editor in chief of something called Image Journal, which is a quarterly um, journal of art and faith, uh, literature, poetry, visual arts. Uh, so the imagination uh, means a lot to me as well. And um, I hope how to how to inhabit time reflects some of that uh, investment in poetry, mm -hmm. songwriting, sure and so on. Yeah, the quotes. You could do a whole book just on those quotes, but you you said something that fascinated me as a philosopher. You said you want to translate philosophy for the church um, into the church. Tell me, tell us about why you think philosophy is important for the church. Yeah, I mean, um, I I think philosophy has always been a spiritual endeavor. Uh, I think it's it's most ancient history is that it was a spiritual endeavor. So when Socrates is inviting people uh, to live an examined life, or when Pierre Hadot talks about the spiritual exercises that comprise philosophy, that's kind of the school of thought that I come from. I'm not so interested in logic chopping and you know solving little puzzles to get tenure i'm interested in philosophy as the pursuit of wisdom and um it seems to me that there has been a long and ancient conversation between christian spirituality and philosophy my my kind of uh patron saint if you will is saint augustine and is he a philosopher is he a theologian is he a pastor he's and the answer is yes, he's, hmm. he's all of those things. So I, I've, I've just come to realize, I think, um, uh, you know, the, the American church could never be said to be guilty of thinking too much. <laughs> uh, and, and so it seems to me that philosophy also represents a little bit of an infusion of reflective capacity that the church is in, in need of. So I've always just tried to bring um i think what are some of the treasures of insight from philosophy down a few shelves so that it could be more accessible because i think it changes how you live do you know what i mean like i i think philosophy is ultimately about how you live a way of life and so it's trying to be in the service of the church as a philosopher in that way Mm -hmm. that's pretty much exactly what we're trying to do on this podcast so. yeah yeah no i wonder i, I love the whole setup yeah yeah, if I were to to describe this book, um, again, just really genuinely loved it, was sucked up into that world that you created, um, and it just called me to notice the common little things around me in greater ways. It caught, it drew, drew me into the present moment, into looking at green leaves and 
that, you know, there's just so much to it that I loved about this book, Jamie, but um, I would call it kind of a guidebook for contemplative living in many ways. Um, you just made you have that intention. Did you have that in mind? And if yeah. so, what, what does contemplative living look like for Jamie Smith? Hmm. Thank you very much for that, by the way. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, I think it is, it's about living both with intention and attention. So I, I think um, what, what the book is trying to do is to kind of cultivate a posture with respect to ourselves, our world, our environments, which then helps us to just pause and slow down and attend to realities and to realize things about the histories we've inherited, about the futures we're hoping for, to sort of zoom in and be slowed down enough that you have that capacity to attend carefully and closely, and then to emerge from that with new intentionality to say, this is what it means to live as somebody who is aware now that I am a mortal, that I have a history, that 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 I have an inheritance that has been passed down to me, that I have things I need to reckon with. So I think, yeah, that combination of attention and intention maybe is a way of describing it. I like it. Excellent. So let's dig into the book a little bit. Before I do that, though, I want to say we could easily spend this entire interview talking about music. And yeah. part of me wants to just ditch the whole. Let's album. do it. <laughs> <laughs> like reading through this, I, I there we're eerily similar in some ways. And we have mm. very similar tastes in music. At one point, mm. you said something and then you had a footnote. And I was going to look up the footnote and I thought, I bet $100 he quotes Jason Isbell. Right? <laughs> And sure enough, that was the footnote. <laughs> yes, yeah. And by the way, the line was originally there, but eventually, I can't tell you, just to, so you know how much I love music, I paid thousands of dollars to include these song lyrics. Because oh, really? the permission, it costs a lot of money just to, to include, include but I just, the, the, the two in particular, I didn't know how to do the chapters I wanted to do without that Brandy Carlisle song and without that Ava Brothers song. And so I was like, whatever it takes, this is my, you know, wow. devotion to the arts kind of thing. But yeah, I, I appreciate the the resonance. Okay, well, well let's, uh, let's, let's just get a, into that question. Well, let's right make there. a note to get into it because okay. I don't want to like okay. waste too much time on that. But, but definitely let's try to get back to that towards the end so i want to ask you about something you say at the beginning of the book and it kind of comes up a few times after that too so you talk about growing up in a dispensationalist context that was superficially fascinated with history but in actuality committed to a kind of ahistoricity but unacknowledged and so this reminded me of one of my favorite novels which i was happy to see came up later uh, in your book, and that's Marilyn Robinson's Gilead. Changed my life. Loved the novel. Mm. I don't want to be the main character when I grew up. Uh, and his name, he's an old Congregationalist minister named John Ames. And he says at one point, I wrote a paper like based around this idea at one point, he talks about being at home in the world, is how he puts it, and how it took him a long time to to get to that place. But as he's reflecting on his long life, he finds that he's gotten there, and he's able to see certain things as beautiful that wouldn't have even caught his attention before. Like, he sees some some you know youths kind of rough and roughhousing and goofing off or whatever, and he he just sees kind of a deep divine beauty in it. Um, and that when I first read it, kind of struck me that idea of being at home in the world struck me as unchristian, because mm. I had been enculturated in the church that I spent most of my youth in to think that I'm a traveler on the earth. I have a true home somewhere else. I should never get too attached to anything, especially things that are merely of temporal significance, you know, which just means fleeting. But that book really kind of reoriented me and it made me think about what it means to be a creature and what significance individual actions and events have. Do you think, is this what you're trying to do in your book? Is that consonant with what you're trying to get at? Very much, very much. And, and I would say to, to set it up, um, Yes. Yeah, so I think a lot of renditions of American Christianity, particularly ones that that have been shaped by dispensationalism, are mostly waiting for history to end. Right. Do you know what I mean, are waiting to get sky hooked out of out of time uh, and to escape the world. So, yeah, you would never you know, you're just a passing through. Whereas 
you know, my my theological framework is shaped by both the Augustinian Catholic tradition and then this sort of continental reform tradition of which I'm a part, Abraham Kuyper and Herman Bovink. And for us, it's it's about a theology of creation that says, no, wait a second, this is affirmed as very good. And in many ways, I think my book is trying to think through a theology of creaturehood, an affirmative theology of creaturehood, and why that entails an affirmation of our temporality, our historicity. So it will also change your eschatology. It's not it's not like you're not longing for kingdom come, but the the coming of the kingdom is not an utter burning up of everything that's come before there's actually a deep this home in which god has placed me and the renewed recreation that we are waiting for so as my friend rich mao likes to point out you know in isaiah 60 the ships of tarshish sail right into the kingdom of god there's there's a there's a continuity that allows that kind of flow and uh i think you're right that Sometimes I forget actually how many people still inhabit that um, a temporal, you know, I, we're floating above it all kind of oh. posture. Yeah, yeah, or they they are functionally at home in the world, but they feel guilty about it. <laughs> right? That they is enjoy so true. More than anything else, campfires with their friends, and you know all the stuff that humans like, you know, if you look into any ancient philosophy about what a picture of the good life is, they're remarkably similar. I remember, you know, I show my, my students what Confucius said about what a, a you know, an ideal day looks like, and it's just goofing off with your friends. You know? yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows that, but yeah. like we're enculturated in this tradition to pretend that it's something else. Yes. I think that's really good. And it, and in some ways they don't have theological permission to, affirm what yet their own embodiment kind of is saying yes to. Yeah. So I want to ask you about a puzzle that you raise, and I don't know if I just want to see, get your, get your take on unpacking this. Cause it's kind of a thing that you mentioned and then move on. So it's about being born again. Mm. Uh, and it's related to something that's kind of bothered me and I'm not sure what I think about it. So uh, you mentioned that being this idea of being born again, is miraculous precisely because it sounds like an impossible thing. How I, as a being that carries its history with it, that's a big theme of the book, right? I am a temporal being, which means I'm formed by my history. It's not a thing back there. It's a thing that I carry around with me all the time. So how could I, with a history, begin again? Uh, and, and this, you know, confuses uh, Nicodemus or whoever it is that Jesus says it to. And it confuses me, frankly. Um, and I want to connect it to the idea of resurrection, because I think the same yeah. paradox happens there. And I think in that case, it has particularly disturbing implications, at least for me, in thinking about how an afterlife could be good, mm. just, or mm. how we can make sense of providence, right? How mm. I don't believe... <laughs> this is both philosophical, but also deeply personal for me. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that making things great in the end is actually any kind of response to things having been bad in the past. I'm very much, uh, you know, if Ivan Karamazov kind of, uh, thinker in that way, like making things better doesn't change the fact that they were once evil. And so if we carry the history of all of the evil and suffering into whatever kind of afterlife they may be, or into this new life in Christ, uh, and we call it a new beginning. I just don't understand that. It's it's a kind of paradox that I don't see my way through ethically, frankly. And yeah, so I'm, and I, I think uh, I I I can appreciate the you know the skepticism about it. I think that's right. Um, I think it's it's not just a matter though of sort of <laughs> it's not a some sort of Jedi mind trick. It's like no, you have a new life now. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not just a, it's not just a descriptive pronouncement. There's something because the mechanism here is, by the way, this answer is not going to satisfy you, but no let worries. me, let me try to articulate where I'm. the, 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 the answer is bound up with the dynamics of grace. Hmm. And so grace isn't just now somebody pronounces a new status 
on who I am. Rather, there is some kind of, um, I almost want to say re-enchantment. There's something that gets reconfigured and probably if we had more time, you would want to talk about ontological implications of this, but we'll just set that aside for a sec. But there's, there is a, there is the sense that there is a reconfiguration of my being in the world such that I have possibilities and capacities living forward that on the one hand take up what has been my past that that bears forward what i've inherited but does not reduce me to those possibilities and has honestly i do think the language of healing would have to be one of those things that that you would talk about so um i i wouldn't ever want it to just be framed as well no we just said this is a happy ending but rather that there's a sort of new possibilities that are infused. I, I suppose there's there's probably a parallel conversation to be had here between, say, Afro-pessimism, which looks at the long history of anti-Blackness and says, I don't ever expect this to ever be different, ta mm -hmm. Coates, yeah. versus, say, a Cornell West who says, well, no, I am a prisoner of hope because I still keep imagining that despite all of that, we could be differently going forward. And, and it's, it's trying to live into that space and possibility. I don't, I'm not saying that I think it's rational or okay. predictable or even something that you could merely extrapolate from what has come from the past. That is why there is a kind of miraculous element to it, which is, which is scandalous. I realize. Yes. Yep. I don't know if that, that as I say, that won't address the concern, but it might at least fill in some of the picture. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care what Kyle thinks. I like the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie, in the, it, also in the introduction, you talk about faith in Christianity being more about how we live than less than, or more than what we believe. I, I've, yeah. I guess you could say I got in trouble. I was preaching through the parables for the last year and get confronted over and over again by Jesus saying things like, hey, there's two sons. A father has two sons. Asked both of them to go work in the fields. One said, yep, I'll do it, but didn't. The other said, no, get lost. I'm, I don't care about your fields. And then he goes and does does the work, which one do, did what his father wanted to do. You come across these all the time in the, in the Gospels where Jesus basically, David Bentley Hart said something to the effect of, Jesus clearly in the Gospels believes in salvation through actions. Um, which is scandalous for evangelicals. I had somebody emailing me back and forth saying, well, what about what Paul said and all that stuff? And I just said, well, what about what Jesus said? <laughs> um, so tell us what your thoughts are. Uh... You win. <laughs> right. <laughs> so two, two questions. Flesh that out a little bit that you think Christianity is more about how we live than what we believe. And do you think Jesus and Paul are at odds or have we read Paul wrongly? Okay. Uh, let me start with the first one. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I think that um, Christianity is not a metaphysical system that you decide to ascribe to. Just explain that for us non-philosophers. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think Christianity is primarily a set of ideas about the world okay. that you now are checking off and say, I agree with this and this and this. You know, it's not just propositional assent to, a, to statements or beliefs. I think that mostly uh, um, to be a Jesus follower is to be the kind of person for whom you are living out a life of dependence on the grace of God. And that happens by living a certain way more than it is about what you articulate. Now, I, I also don't think there's a dichotomy between thinking and being. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think we can articulate an integrity about that. But so for me, Christianity is much more about a set of practices than it is a collection of beliefs. And those practices, those rhythms and rituals and routines are really just means of us putting ourselves at the disposal of grace um, and then being committed. to. So I also don't want I don't. I don't want to be a moralist about Christianity either. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think if 
if being a Christian means that I'm always ethical, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's more like, no, I'm just this person who constantly avails himself of the sacraments or, you know, I'm, I'm, I put myself in the way of this community. And oftentimes there are Sundays I show up and I'm not sure I believe this, <laughs> mm -hmm. but my feet are sort of saying something or doing something because I'm because I'm here. So uh, I I think probably uh, so much of American Protestantism is Pauline to the exclusion of Jesus. Yeah. I, I think there's a way to narrate the continuity between them. It's just that so much American Protestantism has happily set the Jesus stuff aside and sort of fixated on epistles. Why? Because they look like they're about didactic propositions and beliefs and statements when I actually don't think that's the way to read Paul either. Mm -hmm. What is the better way to read Paul then? I mean, I, I think Paul is also proclaiming here is a story that you should live into. I mean, he's giving you kind of the grammar of it, but I think it's only because Paul is presuming these communities that are living out ways of life. We're just getting the epistles, right? Mm -hmm. We're getting the kind of like the, it's like imagining you got a Greek grammar and you knew how to speak the language. It's insane. You're, you've gotten this distilled little piece that really is almost like an artifact, a, a, an artifact of what was a living, robust, messy community that lived out a way of life. And that just couldn't be handed down in quite the same way. So I think we get skewed perceptions. That's in good. A sense. Yeah. So another recurring theme in the book is a distinction you draw about thinking about the church's relation to history. And on one side is what you call primitivism, and on the other side is what you call Catholicity. Can you draw that distinction for the listeners and explain why you're more in favor of the latter? Yeah. So for me, primitivism is, and and by the way, you could also call this originalism. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> um, so primitivism is is a posture to the past in which you assume or believe that there was this kind of original pure deposit of the truth usually in the first century up to the first century and now it's also why it always goes along with revivalism so revivalism is always primitivist because what happens is somebody comes along in 1750 or 1828 or what 1906 and all of a sudden they're the ones who figured out what the pure original first century deposit said. Now, what happens is if you have that primitive view, you really think you're leapfrogging all of history to get back to that original pure deposit. And it's like all the centuries intervening in between are Ichabod, right? The spirit has left the building, a pox on all those houses. Mm -hmm. Catholicity, in contrast, is really rooted in Jesus's promise in the Upper Room Discourse that the Spirit will guide you into all truth over time, right? So it's it has this deeper sense that the Spirit is present to the church across time, including all of those intervening centuries, and that there is a kind of unfurling and unfolding of illumination and insight. So it means that there are all kinds of gifts that keep getting handed down across time rather than the leapfrog back to some sort of original, pristine, pure deposit. Does that is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Very helpful. It sounds quite progressive. Uh, yeah, I... Um, I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> what if it is? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'll, I'll just say this. I do think. Um, so uh, here's I would I would love to just stay with this for a second, because mm -hmm. on the one hand, I really am committed to describing that as Catholicity. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean like I do think that that's the best form? I just don't think Rome or Constantinople own Catholicity. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I think it, this can is available to wider Christian streams. I do think it's exactly why reform is always ongoing as we are inheriting what has gone before. And it is exactly why I don't think the expression of the faith is just static. Mm -hmm. And you probably notice, I mean, one of the key threads of the book is discernment. I think most of our work 
is trying to discern what it means to be faithful now. And I don't think that is ever just a matter of repristinating what we've done in the past. So yeah, it's, it's progressive, but, but only in the sense that, um, oh, I just think we're always getting smarter and better. And do you know what I mean? Like, because you see how it's actually a posture to the past that receives the gifts of history gratefully, but for the sake of a future. Yep. It's also why I'm very critical of nostalgia, right? Mm -hmm. I think a nostalgia is another way of being pointed to the past where you're just trying to claw your way back to some sort of mythical golden era. Yep. Let me, let me bounce to that question then, Kyle, quick, because... I loved what you had to say about nostalgia. That's one of those threads that gets woven throughout the book. And you speak of it, obviously, in less than glowing terms, um, particularly in regard to looking back and trying to get back to the good old days. Can you just tell us tell us why you think that's an unhealthy perspective for Christians or for the church to have? It, first of all, you can see why it's a, it's a um, constant temptation for Christians because we are a people of memory. Right. Like there's so clearly a call to remember, do mm. this in remembrance of me. Um, but it's a disordered way of remembering. Mostly because it is a romanticizing and an editing of yeah. the past. Right. So it romanticizes some past as a golden age, as you know, the 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 um, the faithful times from which we have fallen. Mm -hmm. But it also is so selective and edited, and it turns out to be somebody's version of when it was really good for them in the past, yes. Yes. right? And and by the way, that also usually turns out to be it was really good for white men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's it's as if somebody watches Mad Men and thinks, "Oh man, look, I wish I lived then." <laughs> Tides with Dawn, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, I know room. who you are. I could. I, I don't even have to see you to know who you are if you think that that's a recipe for something to go back to. So I, I think nostalgia is really alive and well today. I think it's a very reactionary posture, and um, uh, uh, it needs to be countered. Mm -hmm. So here's just similar to the last question that I just popped in there about progressivism. And this is not asking you to make a political statement, but yeah. as I read your stuff on nostalgia, it made me think, does your idea of nostalgia equal conservatism? This idea uh, that we have to get back to. For, for um, who knows what conservatism means anymore, but yes, yeah. if, if I do think the notion that the only way to be faithful is to conserve and turn back a clock and and sort of repristinate a past absolutely i think that's not uh, um a, a, well i'll just I'll, i can say this the big thread for me is not letting faithfulness be defined by being static mm -hmm. or recovery or mere conservation i instead of conserving a past i am more interested in how we inherit a past for the sake of a future that we are called to and i i hope that feels different right like i i think the difference with certain unthinking forms of progressivism is that they just throw away all the gifts of the past mm -hmm. and this sort of let's burn it all to the ground and start anew well i you know you can usually see how that works out uh i'm i'm trying to sort of chart this not not a bland middle way but i i think that there are gifts both in the past and that we are called to in the future mm -hmm. yeah so this is a decent segue into the next thing i wanted to ask you about which kind of revolves around and this came up in the middle of the book but then a few times towards the end as well uh revolves around maybe the confidence that the more progressive among us might have in our ability as a community to bring about the kind of eschaton we're looking for. Uh, so in the middle of the book, you, you quote Charles Taylor, the great Canadian philosopher, uh, who says, there's a difference between a view which sees widespread willed social and political transformation as something to be done by those who would achieve regeneration and a view which sees the relevant social and political transformations as needing to be discerned and hence accepted and lived in the right spirit. I think he's talking about Hegel there. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, then, and then you go on and you say, uh, there's a difference between believing we're the ones we've been waiting for and realizing we're called to join the spirit of God coursing through history. 
you ascribe the latter thing to Augustine, you call it the kind of Augustinian view, and the former thing you call Pelagian. Now, this would not be the first time I've been called Pelagian, but I think I take the former view <laughs> more, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. more than the latter. Yeah. But to frame it up, I want to I wanna read something, a uh, famous passage from Martin Luther King Jr., and then I want you to tell me how what you said is consistent. Yeah. Because I, I suspect you think it is consistent. So he says he's talking about people who will say, give it time. Right. That's their counsel. And he says such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time from the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. Human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to set, willing to be the co-workers with God. And he goes on in a similar fashion. And I suspect you think what you're saying is totally consonant with that. But Amen. that to me sounds more Pelagian than Augustine. So, no, 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 no. Explain no. to me how it's So, and, and by the way, by, Martin Luther King Jr. was one of our great Augustinians. <laughs> um honestly like i mean he's pr i think he's pretty explicit about that in some places so i i i would completely sign on to the way dr king articulates that um i think the difference is did you see how what was the end of the phrase are god's co-workers yeah yeah so that the pelagian what i'm calling cultural pelagianism there is where you are where one is overconfident in the ingenuity and willful resourcefulness of humanity on its own mm -hmm. right so the difference t t for me between a kind of rationalist enlightenment progressivism versus an augustinian orientation to reforming the future hinges on how much confidence you have in human ingenuity and willpower and we we might disagree on how much confidence to have. I'm just looking at history and thinking, yeah, eh, I don't see a lot. Uh, instead, I think what Dr. King would say is saying there is it is a matter of us getting caught up in the way the spirit wants to reform the world and bend the arc of justice. Do you know what I mean? So there's we want the same thing. We want the same thing, which is a world where injustice is ebbing. Um, I'm just less confident that humanity has the resources to do that on its own. That doesn't mean that we're sitting around twiddling our fingers waiting for God to come do it. No, it's precisely why we have to answer the call of the spirit in history and join. We are co-participants uh, in that work together, and we but we do need the infusion of grace for that to happen. Yeah. So let me try to say why maybe thinking of it in that way makes me a little bit uncomfortable. So yeah. you cite Niebuhr, uh, Reinhold, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as, as saying that we have to remember that we're both creatures and creators. Uh, and of you, and history, you, yeah. And you really stress the remembering that we're creatures part. And in my experience, the bigger danger is forgetting that we're creators. But that probably has to do with my history, <laughs> which is kind of the so. Point. Yeah, I, 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 I think this is helpful. I think um, we're always exercising demons. So the question is which, right? So I'm, if I'm, if I'm offering caution to what I think it might be an overconfident progressivism at times, I'm going to lean into the fact to say, let's remember we're creatures. If I'm confronting a quietism, passivity, uh, you know, um, dispensationalist, who cares? It's all going to burn up. I'll be like, no, 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 no. You are called to make this world. We are shaping this world. And actually, right now, the only thing God has in the world is us. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's probably a, a difference of emphasis yeah. uh, given yeah. the context. <laughs> Let me ask then, Jamie, you know, you say you look back at human history and you doubt humanity's capacity to bring about that change and justice and all that stuff. The question that I have in that is, why do you think it is that when we look at our world today, the ones who are doing more, and I know that Christians do a lot of good work. I really do. I'm, I'm, I lead a church and like to think that we've done good work, but why do you think it is that it seems like people not in the church and people 
not following Jesus or supposedly not in tune with the Holy Spirit are doing more work of justice and liberation than the church itself. That seems like the church is actually fighting against works of justice and liberation. How does that? Yeah, I would say I know exactly what you mean. I would say, first of all, let's not let our purview be limited to the American American Christianity. Okay. And let's also not let our purview be limited to right now. Um, because I think the fact is, if you think of the deep, long legacies of so many institutions of mercy, care, and justice, they have long Christian legacies. Do you know what I mean? And if and if you and I went to war-torn regions right now in the horror of of Ukraine, for example, you are going to find a lot of Christians on the front lines mm -hmm. doing work that you and I would never think. We might be tweeting about whatever we're outraged about in the United States today, but they are on the front line doing that. So I think empirically, if we were going to settle it out, thankfully, I think the body of Christ is doing better than what you would guess from looking at, you know, America. Yes. Okay. I would, you know? I yeah. fully agree. Yeah, so I want to ask you about iPhones real quick. <laughs> sure. Um, so somewhere in the middle of the book, you you cite that famous picture that circulated. It was a contrast of two pictures, one, uh, both of Tiger Woods, one from when he was winning whatever time. I'm not a sports guy, so whatever yeah. time he won. Um, and everybody was like wrapped with attention to what he was going on, everybody in the crowd. In like 1997. And then, and, in the, yeah, in the 90s. And then just a couple of years ago, I guess he did it again. And everybody in the crowd's holding up their phone, yeah. recording and taking pictures yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the point of the meme is some version of kids these days, <laughs> right? Like, we, like, you know, they're not actually there to experience the moment because they want to capture the moment so they can experience it later. And that is a point that you kind of defend in the book. And I guess I'm less convinced of that. So um, have, have the observers in situations like that actually missed the opportunity to experience the moment, as you put it? Or have they experienced the moment in a mode that earlier humans might have had a harder time recognizing? And I'm wondering this because, one, I'm a millennial, and <laughs> I, I used to be very much against taking i wouldn't take my phone anytime i was gonna like the practice you described having gotten to used to be my practice i would never take pictures and then i gradually learned to value that kind of experience and now i get a much richer experience of having the record and i don't feel that it necessarily takes away from the experience there are probably a handful of experiences i still would keep it in my pocket but but they're the minority um, and also i've been kind of convinced by extended mind arguments and philosophy of mind about yeah we really need to take seriously how much of an extension of ourselves these devices are at this point. And so I'm just curious yeah. uh, if you're willing to fudge on that. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, um, I still take pictures. Uh, I would say that the context of the conversation in the book is more importantly is Sally Mann, who's a fine arts photographer, mm -hmm. who of course was struck by the fact that she couldn't just conjure up memories of her father in the same way because in a ironic way she had outsourced all of her memorization of her father to the photograph she had taken of him so that's an interesting dynamic because i i think you're right embodied extended cognition in our devices we all do i'm all for it like i don't ever want to have to like try to memorize directions anywhere mm -hmm. why it's just a stupid use of brain capacity to do that on the other hand uh, if I'm ever in prison, I want to be able to remember poetry. <laughs> and so I'm a little worried that I'm losing some certain kinds of capacities of what I can carry with me in my body. I, I, this is, I have no strong feelings about this, except I do think there's something about a kind of attention yes. that happens and and if we go back to what we were saying before, you know, I'm kind of interested in attention and intention. I do think there's a kind of attention that happens when I know, you know, I'm I'm thinking of this summer, I'm paddleboarding up the Frio River in this unbelievable canyon in the Texas Hill Country, and um, at the time, I'm trying to be quite intentional about the fact that I'm not taking photos. And so I'm absorbing it. And now in a cold February, Michigan winter, I'm going to be able to sort of call that up for myself in a way that feels different than just looking at my iPhone memories from that day. I, but, I, you know, 
let many flowers bloom. Um, <laughs> I, I just think there's something about a way of attending to the world that makes us available to the experience, I, which is all that I'm interested in. Sure. You know? Yeah. And I think that story is super interesting of that photographer being able to picture her friend who she has no photos of, like he's right there with her. Yes. Yeah. Her. So interesting. Yeah. Um, jumping forward in the book to your chapter called Embrace the Ephemeral. Eph Ephemeral. 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 Yeah. It again. <laughs> Ephemeral. So <laughs> jumping forward to your chapter in the book called Embrace the Ephemeral. I loved it. I could have just. Thank you. It's kind of my favorite chapter. So uh, that really means a lot. It's not me. even kind of my favorite chapter. It's by far my favorite <laughs> chapter. That's awesome. Um, it rooted me in the beauty of now. I mean, even just this thought of um, autumnal leaves turning colors and dying as they're doing that and giving us these gifts of color. And it caused me literally to raise my eyes and look up at my oak tree leaves that I was canopied it with as I was reading your book and just mm. enjoying those leaves for what they are, you know? Um, but in it, you say, and I love this quote, and I want you to just elaborate for our listeners, for us even, you say, the trick is to live fully present in the moment without being defined by the zeitgeist. Can you flesh that out for us a little bit yeah um so first of all i i think it's helping going back to something you said earlier in a way sometimes uh people who are believers experience this tension between what they think they are supposed to affirm theologically and what they actually like <laughs> mm -hmm. and so this is about trying to put these things together and say to embrace the ephemeral is to appreciate the fleetingness and there's nothing in christian hope and eschatology that prevents us from saying even though this is going to pass away it is a good gift to me right now in this moment yeah. so I, I i want us to sort of lean in and say that's part of the beauty of being mortal um but to then so to to receive the now without being defined by the now Mm -hmm. that's where the resistance to the zeitgeist I, it's not I, I don't want you to think that i don't think we should be attuned and a, attentive to what's happening around us I, we always need to be speaking to that um but but we need to have resources that stretch us beyond just our temporal moment. Otherwise, I think what happens is we become so um, susceptible to the tyranny of the present and the tyranny of the urgent. And what, what starts happening is you fritter away your identity because you don't know who you are until somebody tells you how you're supposed to be reacting right now. Wow. And I think that's, that's a, that's a very, um, um, uh, disempowering place to be i think folks need a kind of uh, a capacity to to be stretched beyond just the, the present it's mm -hmm. brilliant um we are going to have a little time so let me ask my my add-on question before you get to your last sure. one because yeah, no it just works here you in the book you use ecclesiastes and the voice of kohelet the teacher um is kind of a anchoring point you know meditations before between chapters and it's brilliant um oh, i you. love ecclesiastes but it's a it's a rough book you know and it's it is it's and it's, which is why it hardly ever gets preached on it seems to me in a lot of protestant churches i would agree we were i was preaching through ecclesiastes and right in the middle of our study in ecclesiastes COVID happened and it was perfect <laughs> it was <laughs> so perfect. but i mean ecclesiastes is littered with landmines for a christian bookstore version of christianity that tells <laughs> us that everything's going to be great and we'll all be swept up on eagle's wings if we just trust in jesus right what is it about ecclesiastes and the voice of kohelet that you find profound and speaks to you yeah i um i, I like the way you framed that the, it is such an utterly honest appraisal of the human condition mm -hmm. and um there is it's not a mistake that it's grouped in what we call our wisdom literature right so there is this kind of sort of philosophical reflective capacity about it i i think the other thing that attracted me you know, so i'm in my 50s now which feels ancient <laughs> and uh it is the voice of an old person do you yeah. know what i mean like it's it's the voice of someone who's been through it 
Mm-hmm. And the older I get, the more I'm interested in shutting up and listening to the people who've been through it, mm-hmm. you know, who have undergone and to realize that I have many gifts to receive from what they have endured and made it out to the other side. And that's what I, I think reading Ecclesiastes felt like, oh, no, this is somebody who's been through it and is now sending a message in a bottle back across the river to maybe I haven't gone through it all yet. And he sort of like be prepared. And I, I guess I appreciate the utter honesty and that that the that the history of the church saw fit to include that in the canon of scripture. Mm hmm. Yeah. Something says something about an honest Christianity, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Something that we've lost. Yeah. I mean, something that Kohela was actually a heretic and didn't really believe in, in the gut. Right. But we've included that into the narrative. It's fascinating. Yes. Yeah. But, it's like, it's like Psalms of lament too. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think those are such an integral minor chord moment of the scriptures. And as you say, in American Christianity, uh, in particular, it seems to me we want to right, race ahead to the happy ending and to be reminded of these uh, difficult moments is important. Yep. So we hinted at this at the beginning of the interview. We're coming to the the close of our time. But the music you highlighted, you spent mm. thousands of dollars. It blows me away. The, the shows the love and importance of music in your world. Mm-hmm. Don't we tell love... my wife, by the way. She... <laughs> <laughs> we we love. You know this is public, right? <laughs> <laughs> she's not listening to my podcast. Just to be clear, <laughs> I was going to say if she's listening to all your podcasts, <laughs> good on her. Um, but we love music, and the ones that stuck. I love the Avet Brothers. Um, that spoke so much to what it means to be American and what it means to live in that tension and dilemma. But the ones that I was drawn to because I love these songs and these artists is Brandy Carlisle's. Every time I hear that song, you said it's yeah. become like a sacrament to you. Yeah. And I want to hit on the Fleet Foxes. I'm not my season. Um, yeah. Why has every time I hear that song become like a sacrament to you? First off, man, I, I have to tell you. Um, so partly, I, I'm not going to treat you as my therapist, but like, I'll just say, I've got some shit in my life. Do you know what I mean? Like, really, yeah. really pretty deep. Uh, uh, traumatic stuff, and um, uh, uh, and, and and that song is about the possibility of moving forward in a way that both names why it shouldn't have to happen, why it couldn't possibly happen, and then how it might happen. And uh, it, to me, it's, it's, and, and Brandy's voice is actually, I think a really, really important part of it. Part, part of the struggle of just citing lyrics in a, in a book is uh, you don't get the voice. What I do is I create a Spotify playlist to go with the book so that people can go and find the songs and listen to it. Because I think the, the range and timber of Brandy's voice so embodies the brokenness and hope at the same time. And so uh, honestly, she that song kind of helped me imagine uh, a way forward in a relationship that I didn't know might have been possible. And uh, music, a lot of music has done that for me too. You know, like music has probably been just such a constant companion. Jason Isbell, the Avett Brothers, um, it's it's all part of the sonic wallpaper of my life and i think it's means of grace yeah no i mean that song in particular sounds like somebody who's done the hard work of trying to fit this traumatic experience into her story Mm -hmm. and doesn't end it even on by the way i forgive you but Mm -hmm. then says and by the way i'm also kind of grateful for what happened because it's incredible maybe i should thank you Right. You know, and it's like, yeah. and I remember when I first kind of like, you know, how you hear a song a few times, and you're not really listening. And then you listen to it. And you're like, no, that's, that's wrong. You shouldn't be saying that's absolutely wrong. You yeah. shouldn't be saying. Yeah. And then you stay with it a few more times. You're like, okay, I think I maybe understand how somebody could say that. Could I say that? What would it look like? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's powerful. You yep. noted in the book had the flippancy with which the lyric comes across, by the way, this yeah. deep, profound thing. And it hadn't occurred to me like that's the that's what she titled the album. I've listened to that album probably a hundred times <laughs> and, and it had never occurred to me to see that insight in it. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. 
and then probably my favorite band fleet foxes you uh yeah you i think the some of their most profound lyrics the i'm not the season that i'm in yes. um, i love that so much tell us about how that came out in your past. well and it's uh, it's and again they're very kind of plaintive i would almost call it a contemplative sound do you know what i mean like there's a there's a there's almost a, a hint of a kind of chant about it sometimes haunting. it's haunting it's very haunting and so then when you kind of keep dwelling with it and and i and the the insight sort of swells for you right and then you just hear it as this incredible it's almost like a benediction yes you are not what you're going through right now you yeah. are not defined by this moment you are not your season you're in a season, and and I think a lot of people need permission to recognize that. I think that's the other chapter that means a lot to me is the chapter on seasonality, where it's like, yeah. okay, what does it mean to take seriously the fact that I'm in the middle of a season? And it gives you permission to both name it, but then also say, I'm not defined by this. And I sometimes I just have to get through it. Um, it's, a, it's a really beautiful... I'm very excited, by the way. Did you see they're publishing a collection of Fleet Fox's lyrics? as sort of poetry and it's going to be introduced by one of my favorite contemporary writers brandon taylor so i'm very excited to see that that's wow. fun that's super fun really yeah. cool before we let you go i have to ask have you seen the movie about time i no, i haven't so tell oh me oh my god you have to watch it so is it um is it about a black family no 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 so this no, is, no. it's you, you could call it a rom-com but it's not I, i'm not going to describe it for you okay it, okay it, it, i gotta it in genre barriers it has a wonderful cast and it's the best movie about nostalgia ever made fantastic i might download this for my next flight okay great yeah. thanks for the tip awesome do you have anything else kyle no i think we're at the end of our time so thanks so wonderful. much for joining us I, I gotta say man the book is really good moved me to tears more than thank one. thank you so um, much no i really appreciate you guys were very very close readers so that's an honor that means a lot as an author to be able yeah. to interact that's with a folks great model of how philosophy can actually transform a life i think so so. let's have more of it i hope yeah, yeah. thank you so uh, much once more the book is how to inhabit time by james k A. smith jamie thank you so much for joining us really my pleasure thanks for a rich conversation i appreciated it